Thank you for that. So if this is your first time joining us for our Beyond Access webinar, this week we're using Zoom webinar. You should have a dashboard. On the dashboard is a question and answer section and a chat section. We do encourage you to participate by pla placing your information um, or questions or concerns that you have in the Q&A section. Um, we, this is being recorded, so we do ask folks, if you are not an interpreter, um, please uh, stay off of video. Um, our interpreters too, you may not need your video, so you can take that off because folks will be able to use the conference lines. So I will ask folks to stay off of video for this evening. Um, and we will start to uh, we'll start to disable that for folks as well too, just not to distract from our, our wonderful presenters this evening. Again, my name is Andre Mitchell. Thank you for those that are joining us for this week's Beyond Access series. This is our third, our second of three installations for this evening. And I don't want to waste any more time. Let me take it away. Thanks. Thanks so much, Andre. Um, it does sound like one of the interpreters has their audio on. We can hear like background noise. So if those folks, one called Test Spanish Test, has we keep seeing pop up. Um, yeah, I don't know, Andre. Is that something you can? Can um, mute or if the yeah, let me see if I can mute all okay. on first. Yeah, thanks. There we got muted too. So now we're now we're on <laughs> and ready to go. Um, hi everyone, thanks for so much for joining us. We're happy uh, that you uh, are with us today. We're excited to talk to you about visual supports, uh, another strengths based support that can help. Uh, all children and really all human beings. Uh, my name is Aaron Lanou. And I'm Cade Friedman. My pronouns are they, them. My pronouns are he, him. And um, we hope that you had an opportunity to either join us last time or maybe see the recording of the video on YouTube when we talk about strengths-based language. And we're going to keep the strengths-based train rolling um, and talk about visual supports, which is another um, type of support that can be used at home that is uh, very strengths-based, that is a good way to support uh, all kinds of kids and really all kinds of people. Aaron and I are also total geeks about visuals mm. and we spend hours and hours and hours talking about this. So um, yeah. we're really excited to share with you. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's just um, share what the time will look like a little bit. We want to do a little bit of context setting with you all. Um, our time will consist of four main parts. First, we'll start by talking about how to create helpful routines. Um, visuals for times of the day that you do on a repeated basis. Second, we'll talk about clarifying directions. So using visuals to help to communicate something clearly when you're trying to um, give a, a clear direction. Third, we'll talk about how to support self-regulation. So visuals that can be used to support students in sort of regulating their, their bodies and minds um, to be in, a, in an optimal state. And fourth, um, we'll have a couple of videos, little instructional videos that we've made uh, to show you how to actually make some of these yourself. Um, we'll have one video on how to do this uh, with digital tools and one uh, video about how to do this analog, old fashioned style. Um, our promise to you is that you will walk away from this, or maybe if you're in a chair, just sort of scoot away from this with um, tools and resources that you can use right away. We want this to be very practical. And as you're hearing about some of these examples, um, we want you to be thinking like, great, what can I make later tonight or tomorrow that might help tomorrow or this weekend go even more smoothly? And our goals are to both understand the benefits of visual support so we know why they're so useful and powerful and whom they can help. And also for you to be able to create your own visual supports and feel comfortable doing that. And our premise, our foundation here is that visuals are powerful. They're a go to strategy in inclusive classrooms and they can work in your home too. And we're hoping that by showing you some of these visual tools that your student is benefiting from at school, that you can have that consistency and use them at home also. So with that, we're gonna go into our part one, visual supports for creating helpful routines. 
All right, so this is the uh, participant exercise. This is my Google Calendar. Um, I wonder if any of your Google Calendars look like this. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my color coding because this is a visual tool that I use um, to keep my life organized, right? So dark blue are my personal things that make me happy and that are my own time. My purple is work. Yellow means I'm listening. Green means I'm performing or talking like I am right now. Um, and we wanted to start with like an adult example to help you connect to how this shows up in your life. Yeah, and, and it's a great example to have a, a you know, very practical example of how we use this all the time, like visual support, everybody. Um, and this is example here shows how visuals help everybody in another way. Um, you see here these two different sort of people uh, are thinking about a tree and they have a very different internal image of what a tree looks like to them. And this is just true of how humans communicate and operate and interpret things around them is that we all have our own like conception and understanding of the things around us that we see that we hear. Um, and it's not always easy to know that someone is seeing understanding conceptualizing something differently than us. Yes, we can ask and we can talk about it, but even using words, we still might not get a full sense uh, that someone is kind of understanding something from a slightly different perspective. Visuals help to clarify that. They help to clear up ambiguity. They help to concretize, make more concrete things that could otherwise be abstract or ambiguous or different between a couple of different people. Here's a quote that sort of takes that a step further. This is from a, a woman named Judy Endow, who says that using a visual schedule and other visual supports are powerful in establishing a working external organization or making sense of the world around us. Uh, Judy Endow is an autistic self-advocate. Um, she actually started her life in an institution, has become a very well-known author and speaker and expert in uh, the world of autism. And I really appreciate this perspective that visual support can create an, a working external organization. And she actually talks about how uh, some things in her life don't feel super organized. She doesn't have an internal organization system for a lot of things. And that visuals helped create that externally for her so that she feels more safe, so that things are more predictable. So our first example that we're going to share with you about creating uh, visuals for helpful routines about packing up for school. We tried to think of examples that would be really relatable and that might be like, oh, I could totally use this at home. Yeah, absolutely. So um, here's one that we imagine might be tricky at times for some families just getting ready to go to school. And here's an example of how to use a clear, broken down visual support that embeds some interest. That's in this case, we imagine this child is very interested in Thomas. Uh, and it uses visual supports for each step of the um, process of getting ready for school. So it's very clearly broken down. We get dressed first, then we use the toilet, wash our hands, brush our teeth, then we eat breakfast. And each step has a very simple and very clear visual that matches that step. Um, you see there's little check boxes on the side and this is, um, you know, the way you make a visual support is up to whatever will work well in your home. You can print this and have a brand new one every single day and have your child check them off as they get ready. Um, maybe not super easy to maintain and not the best for the environment. If that's a concern of yours, you could print one and put like packing tape over it and they could use a little dry erase marker and wipe it off every day. But the other example you see here is there's a little paper clip. Um, maybe there isn't any need to write on the schedule and instead um, as your child goes through steps, they can kind of move the paper clip down to get that sense of progressing through the steps. Clothespin. That's a clothespin. <laughs> That's right. You can also use a paper clip, but yeah. that happens to be. We have other examples of paper clips. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another example uh, of a different morning routine. Um, this uh, might be for a student or a child um, who um, is maybe at just a sort of different uh, level of being able to recognize and take it information from, uh, excuse me, from photographs as opposed to uh, representative icons. Um, it also uses a little bit more language. So it says bathroom stuff and then clarifies what's involved. Um, uh, and it's broken down just slightly differently, right? Bathroom stuff, packing up, eating, and leaving. Uh, also with these checkboxes, and as we mentioned before, you can use a 
paperclip, a clothespin, <laughs> uh, have them write on this or, or whatever the case may be. However, is it whatever easily, easily manageable routine that you can develop um, with your child so they can get a sense of that progress, but that you don't have to fumble and find a new copy of your morning routine every single day, right? You want this, this to be something they can do consistently. And it's also using photos. These are just like, you know, from Google images and you could search those with your child, right? And make it together. Um, or you could also just take photos of your child throughout this process and then use those photos um, in the example, which is often how it happens um, in school. Uh, and last session, we talked about how it's great to be able to talk about neurodivergence and disability with your kid when they're ready. And we said that gender might also be something that your kid is ready to talk about. And so this particular chart is coded in the colors of the non-binary flag, right? And so the ways that we pull in kids' interests and things they're thinking about um, to help make it feel really personal and special. Yeah. Um, also a note about the photos, the more, for, for some children, the more concrete and accurate and clear the photo is, the better. And so Google Images is a good go-to um, to find general pictures of brushing teeth. But for some children, um, the color of the toothbrush might be different and that doesn't look like their toothbrush and they might not relate to that step. And so in that case, um, like Kate mentioned, it's, it's great to use accurate photos of the actual objects or of your child doing those steps so that the images are as representative and clear and accurate as possible. And that'll just depend on your child. All right, so we're moving into the homework trackers. Um, and this is also often like a pain point for families that at the end of the day, kids come home and they jump into homework or they don't. Um, and so visuals are a great way to sort of structure that time to help kids gain some independence. So here's our first example, um, and we're bringing in a special interest of My Little Pony, and this one has a paperclip. Yes, and um, part of what's special about this particular kind of chart, um, this particular visual, is that you're building in that it's okay to make mistakes, right? So you have the different subjects that a kid might have for homework. They're going to circle off when they are done with it, which is like a, a progress bar to know that you're moving through and to see your progress and feel like you're you're making headway. Um, and then there's the option to say, I'm ready, and this can be checked by a grown up, or I need some help. And to be able to check off and say, like, it's okay to check off that you need some help with this. Here's another example, um, a slightly different format. Um, and this one uses the trans flag colors uh, with a lot more language. Um, these are like multi step directions within each box, right? Whereas before we were really like looking at one step at a time. Um, and this one also embeds not just what's going to happen, but also what you might need, right? Like you might need to get your noise canceling headphones before you jump into homework. Sorry, I'm blocking it. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Think, okay. I'm gonna, gonna do this take one. these two. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So <laughs> the other time, our last example for creating schedules, um, visuals for a, a routine is when you're preparing for something new, right? Like maybe you're going to go see a new doctor, or maybe you're about to try out a different grocery store, or maybe you're going to an amusement park, or maybe you're going to like visit relatives you don't see often. Um, these are also great times to sort of co-create the expectations with kids. Um, and even if they're sitting and watching you make it and you're talking through, that can be really helpful in mentally and emotionally preparing for this new event. And so our first example is grocery shopping with dad. Um, and you'll see later in the how to video. This is the this is the visual schedule that I made in my how to video for you all. Um, and the idea for this also is that you're going to start to increase kids independence in dealing with these new um, events by having sort of like a little play by play that they can move through. And here's our last example, um, which is, you know, visiting Nana and Pop Pop and sort of this one's using emojis, um, which is also like you can do this on your phone, right? It's super quick and easy because we all know this keyboard now, um, but sort of like really walks through the steps of traveling somewhere and then coming home. Um, and particularly like with the, the paper clip, because you're like walking and moving and getting on the, the train um, helps kids sort of like manage the time and know what's coming next. Mm. Do you want to talk also about the saying hello and saying goodbye emojis and why you chose those emojis? 
Does that have to do oh, with yes. options for how to say hello and how yes. to say goodbye? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we were thinking a lot about consent also. And lots of times when you're visiting family, there's this like embedded expectation that you're going to like hug and kiss everyone. And we know like that's not that doesn't feel right for for some kids. And so the say hello and say goodbye has options where you could wave, fist bump, kiss or hug. And you could choose any or all of them or none of them, right? Um, you could just say hello. <laughs> and we want to just sort of like name that also, that it's important for kids to have some agency in how they're interacting with people. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And, and um, obviously comes with maybe having some discussion with other family members, Nana and Papa might need to be um, prepared yeah. because if they just can't wait to hug their um, little one, uh, that might might be met with some questions. Yeah. So just to make sure that everyone is clear on those expectations, and this is something that you are having discussions about and, and working on and teaching um, with your child, um, you know, it's an important component of that. But one of the, you know, sort of potential downfalls about using a visual schedule is that they can become, they have the potential to become um, you must, you must, you must, you must, very sort of top down, like an adult is saying, here's what is going to happen. You have to yeah. follow these steps. Now, obviously, as we've been talking about, they can be an incredibly helpful organizational tool to help make things predictable and clear and concrete. Um, but we do want to just sort of be thinking about the child's involvement. And you already talked about like making the schedule with them together, but also having choice uh, and options built into the schedule is a really important part of having um, a schedule. So. Um, at brush teeth time for one of our earlier examples, you could, I don't know if your child has multiple toothbrushes, but you can ch choose the yellow toothbrush or the blue toothbrush. And that feels like they're sort of involved in yeah. and uh, making some decisions about and choices for their own life and their own routines that they go in. And this is another really good example of how to build that into a, to a schedule. Yeah. Um, so we're going to shift. That was our first sort of example or application of using visuals um, about routines. So we're going to shift into using visual supports to clarify directions. Same caveat sort of applies here. We want to make sure that we are using visuals to um, support and make things clearer and communicate very clearly. Uh, the intent of these is not to um, finger wag or dictate how a child must be in all times. There's sort of flexibility built in, um, right? Student and child sort of choice and involvement in these as well. But the fact remains that sometimes you have to tell a kid to do a thing because it's time to clean up or get ready or do something different. Uh, and sometimes those verbal directions aren't heard, understood, processed, remembered. And a visual support can be a great way to um, sort of correct those potential pitfalls. Um, and so again, as we think about this new section of uh, clarifying directions, let's think about us as adults and how we use and are exposed to visual supports all the time. Um, you may find yourself driving, if you drive down an unfamiliar road and see a sign like this. And instantaneously, you know what that means. And you might, since it's an unfamiliar place, uh, be driving a little bit more cautiously and sort of be looking at the road a little bit more. At least that's the intent of the sign, right? It means um, that rocks might fall. Yeah, right. In case in case anyone is not a driver, um, yeah. right, and has been in, in <laughs> only in the subway, they don't have this sign in the subways, no. fortunately. But let's say you were driving down the road and you saw this sign. Wouldn't it be different? How would it feel different if you saw this instead? Option B on the right, right? Something very important that you need to know right now. But uh, just so you know, please heads up. There might be falling rocks and please drive more cautiously. No, 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 no. No. We need to know this information in an instant. It needs to be clear. And this is a, a, something that we might see multiple times in our life, whether we're driving in New York or in... Ohio. So this creation of a visual that means something very clearly and communicates something quickly, instantaneously, is incredibly powerful for us uh, as adults, as drivers, right? And the same principle applies to creating uh, visuals to support children. We can use visuals to communicate something that would take lots of words or lots of writing or lots of explanation that just says exactly what we intend with a picture, with an image. The reason this is so powerful and the reason this works for us as adults and children of all kinds um, is due to something that's called uh, the dual coding theory. And without getting too technical, 
uh, essentially dual coding theory, psychologists have learned, uh, explains that when we take in information from our environment, we take in auditory information, so like sound and visual information to our eyes in separate channels. So what this actually means is visual information can support verbal information or auditory information that we're getting rather than sort of compete or conflict or overload our brains. It actually helps to work together. And so there's a quote from um, a psychologist who's done a lot of work on visual design, Richard Meyer, who talks about people learning better from graphics and words together than from words alone. And so um, if we are giving directions, we can give that verbal direction and pair it with a visual to help ensure that it's understood, comprehended, remembered a lot better than certainly than just using words alone. Uh, here's another quote from another autistic self-advocate who explains her own experience with this. Uh, and she says, with visuals, I can see how information connects, allowing my brain to cut down several cognitive processes that would otherwise have to be involved in the information that was delivered in a massive chunk of text or by auditory channels. And so she's reflecting the same idea that science proves to us that visuals help to um, clarify and streamline information coming in that otherwise might be overloaded if we're getting too much language either written or, or spoken. So let's talk about examples of what it can look like when um, we give directions and how we use visuals to support give, giving directions. The first example is um, a sort of simple one but has the potential to be very powerful. It's um, for directions you give frequently. Um, I can relate as a teacher, but I imagine family members um, listening here can, can relate as well, that uh, as a teacher, there are lots of times that I just said the same thing over and over again. Um, like, don't forget to pick up your pencil. Don't forget to pick up your pencil. Don't forget to pick up your pencil. I was talking about tie the pencil. Tie your shoes. Tie your shoes, tie, tie your shoes. shoes. Yeah, tie your early shoes. childhood, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and we find ourselves saying these things over and over and over again. Um, it can be very powerful when you recognize that we have to give the same direction over and over again. And kids, for whatever reasons, need those reminders and that, and that feedback to learn a new skill. And instead of feeling like we're nagging and just saying the same thing over and over again, we can use a visual to, um, to help clarify that, again, instantaneously, just like that um, traffic sign. So let's say you have a child who has lots of energy and they move around a lot, and there could be lots of reasons for why that is, and you want to allow that, you want to encourage that, but there are also times when, um, because of what's going on in your home, uh, because you want them to try to focus on some homework, let's say, it's just important for them to kind of like regulate and slow their body down. But instead of slow down, slow down, slow down, let's get together. I said, stop running. Yeah. How many times have I told you? Uh, right? No. Instead, let's just make a simple visual. With, let's say a turtle with the word slow. It's kind of calming, right? Simple visual. And we either print this out, we have it on an index card, we draw it, we have it on a post-it note. Um, maybe your child helps make it and picks out what animal it would be or draws a little funny face on the turtle. Maybe it's a magnet with a, on the fridge. Yeah. And instead of feeling like you have to give that verbal reminder over and over again, it's so simple and powerful to just grab the visual and display it in front of the child. And that they've seen it before, they know exactly what it means, and without feeling like they have to process the auditory information, they get the message and they can understand what it is you're trying to communicate. Again, the context for this is it's okay for kids to have energy too sometimes, right? But there are times when um, uh, helping them regulate and slow their body down um, is, is important for their safety, for focus, whatever it might be. And so in those times when we do need to give a direction like that, using a visual like this can, can be very supportive. Another example is if you need to give directions on the fly, especially if it's more than just one direction, not just, oh, slow down, but you, you need to support your child in understanding a few things that they have to do. Um, these on the fly examples can be a very powerful way to um, organize and clarify multi-step directions that um, don't have to take a lot of preparation. That last example we did on the computer and it didn't take long, but you have to make it and print it. Sometimes you just grab a post-it or a scrap piece of paper, or a piece of junk mail that you have that's lying around, and just make a simple checklist. Oh, it's time to charge your iPad, put away your books, and wipe down the table for dinner. 
you make little check boxes so that if you want them to actively check these off, like we were talking about with the with the helpful routines earlier, that they can do that so they can monitor their own progress, feel like they're making progress. You can glance at this around the corner as you're prepping dinner and see, oh, it looks like you put away books. What comes next? You don't need to give any more language than that. They have the visual right there as a reference. It seems so simple that it might not be necessary, but it's so powerful that it is. <laughs> These can be really, really nice way to help kids see what's expected, um, remember if they can't retain multi-step directions, have a harder time um, retaining multi-step directions, and just know what's expected and feel a sense of success as they progress through these couple of steps that you've asked them to do. Okay. Okay, so we're moving into our next, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're moving into our next example. Yeah. Um, directions that make room for a response. Um, and sometimes we wanna think about directions not just coming from an adult, but also being sort of a give and take where kids have a say also. Um, and so our first example um, is a double sided card that's red on one side and green on the other. And you can make this with anything with construction paper, you know, with a, a post it with scrap paper from your recycling bin and a, a crayon. And the idea is that when kids are working, they can have the green side up to, to let you know that they're doing fine, they don't need anything, and they just flip it over to the red side, so the red side is up when they need support. Um, and the idea is that instead of having to come up with the language to come ask for help, um, which for a whole variety of reasons could be really tricky, this is a visual way to let you know, I'm doing okay, I need some help. Um, and you might have given a direction to do something where now a kid has a way to communicate with you. And it doesn't have to be that it's sitting right there on the table. They can also come show you. It's a great example also of, we talked about giving directions to students, but this is a good way that your child can communicate back with you yeah. using a visual support that you've worked on. With them. And it's creating self-advocacy, right? You're giving the child the, a tool to help them advocate for their needs, even though you've just given them a direction. So this is another example. This is a sign for your child's door um, that says my homework is done on one side and my I'm doing my homework on the other side. Um, and so this is the not the like um, adult constantly saying, have you finished your homework yet? Or like you've been working on this for an hour, but a way for a kid to hold that and communicate their needs. Um, and part of this would also be that if they needed help, they would just come ask you for help. But if they're in a room quietly working, um, they have the ability to let you know. And if you're in a pinch and you don't have the sign and the little thumbtack, red post it, green post it, or totally. whatever system you, you come up with to communicate the same thing. Yeah. So now we're going to move into our last section, which is using visual supports to help children self regulate. Um, and this is just so key in terms of like independence and feeling autonomous and having some agency and being able to self-regulate and also communicate that. Yeah, and the idea with our little icon here that represents self-regulation is the idea that um, I've heard it said before, if only humans came with a check engine light, you know, the little <laughs> exclamation point that pops up in your, in your dashboard when you need to change the oil or something mysterious happening in your car. We unfortunately don't, but it's a good reminder that um, we do need to check in with ourselves and support children and checking in with themselves about what is going on with their bodies so that we take a break before things get really challenging so that we have tools to self regulate before things get uh, get really tricky for us. Yeah, and so our sort of approach there's lots of ways to think about defining self regulation. Um, I'll be really interested if um, Suzanne wants to uh, contribute now or a little bit later too, but um, we talk about self regulation as being two parts monitoring and modifying. So monitoring yourself, checking in with where you're at, like that check engine light, like, am I feeling a little low energy or a little frantic or uh, where do I feel something in my body that makes me sort of sense that something feels a little off? It's monitoring and modifying your thoughts and actions, having tools to get to the place you want to be um, so that you can get to a more optimal state. It's important to know that an optimal state isn't always calm, right? Self-regulation doesn't just mean calm down. It's important to note, as we are reminded by this great uh, autistic artist who goes by Neuro Wild on Instagram and other platforms, that regulated means that your energy matches the task. It doesn't mean calm. 
So be regulated at a football game means to be excited and jumping up and down and moving your hands around or whatever, right? To be regulated in a library is more classically what we think about, having a calm body uh, and sitting still, right? But the energy needs to match the task. I want to just note also that being regulated doesn't mean that it could look the way you as an adult thinks it will look for your child. Mm -hmm. And your child might say, I'm like, even though I'm doing this, I'm really calm right now, right? Like when I stim, I'm still calm. <laughs> um, and so what sometimes what people think self-regulation looks like might not actually be what how it presents in a kid. And it's great to ask, like, how are you feeling right now in your body? Yeah. Like, are you able to focus? Great, let's keep going, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you as family members know your children best and that this can only come from knowing your child and communicating with your child. If your child is doing this, that might mean that they're anxious about something and you've learned that. It also just means this is how I'm able to sit still. Yeah. Right. So the same gesture to an observer could mean very different things. So um, again, we as adults have to self-regulate, right? This is work that we uh, can, can all relate to. Some of us may, and maybe you right now, have tea in a mug sitting in front of you that has a daily affirmation on it, that being I'm calm, I'm content. We need reminders in our environment and tools around us to help us get to that optimal state, right? We can't always just do it on our own. We need like tools and techniques to do that. Even um, the act of a warm beverage uh, is self-regulating for me. It doesn't even matter what kind of mug it's in. <laughs> in this case, <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are other ways that we self-regulate and we all sort of develop our own things, whether it's been conscious or just it's developed naturally. Some people like to twirl, twirl a pen, which was me in college all of the time. I got real good at some of the, the tricks where you just like spin them and don't drop them. Some people just need to take a deep breath or two. And that's how they help to regulate in the moment. Other people might need to chew gum. They just need to do something with their body and that feedback that they get from chewing gum uh, helps them to, to be able to stay focused or again, reach that optimal state. We all have different ways that we've developed to help us do what we need to do in whatever settings we're in. And we wanna help support our children to be able to do the same. So here's Agustina again from The Autistic Life. Um, and they say, bringing awareness to different cognitive processing styles is so important as it allows us to try tools that are potentially more aligned to our neurodivergent profiles and more likely to work for us with the focus on building up our strengths rather than just working on our challenges. For visual thinkers, this means leaning into our visual spatial ability and integrating visual tools into our daily life. And we just wanna keep bringing in different voices um, of people who are disabled and neurodivergent who really benefit from visuals. Mm -hmm. So this is our third section of examples, which is using visuals to help identify emotions. Um, and you might recognize the characters on the next picture from inside out. Um, and this is a color coded system using the characters that kids might know to help them identify their feelings. And part of self regulation is the first step is knowing how you feel. And sometimes you can verbalize it and sometimes you can't. And so being able to point to one of these doot, 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 and say which one you're feeling like or say, you know what, I'm actually like a yellow and a blue right now, right? You can have multiple emotions at once um, is really a great way to get that the first step of self-regulation going of like understanding and acknowledging how you feel. Here's another example that doesn't use any words. Um, and so these are like you know, parts of the world that you might identify with to help explain how you're feeling. We'll share the slides as we do yep. after these. So if any of these resonate, you look um, uh, helpful. Don't uh, worry if you're not able to grab a photo of your screen in time. Um, but also another thing, just like we talked about with some of the other visual support strategies is you may want to develop some of these with your child. Yeah. And maybe you want to make a three by three grid of very evocative, emotional, colorful drawings that they've done that they then come, come back to later uh, and point to and say, I'm feeling this way. And that means something to them and because they've helped to develop it, help create it. Or characters. It's, mm -hmm. it's really great to pull characters that have specific 
personality types and to be like, I'm feeling like Tigger right now, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm feeling like Lightning McQueen right now. Um, and to have that be like a shared language where you can point to that and your family will know what you feel. This is a mood meter from the social emotional program ruler that was developed at Yale. And there's different quadrants that equate just like the inside out images to different feelings. And so this is a more advanced version where you can pick adjectives um, along the continuum that help explain different emotions. And a simpler version, if a child maybe isn't ready quite for this like sophisticated emotional vocabulary, yeah, there are versions you can find very easily on Google Images that just have the colors. They don't have any of the words. And again, you you might it might be easier for someone to say like I'm I'm in the red right now rather than or just feeling, point to it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Then then have to use that uh, emotional vocabulary. And so just like we say, bring in special interests. Um, Aaron and I are super big fans of Drag Race, and so we brought in Latrice. Um, to say which Latrice are you feeling like today on a scale of Latrice, how are you feeling um, and you can find these on Google also if you say on a scale of um, and then put in the TV show or. Um, yeah, whatever character personality yeah, animals there's yeah. some really great like guinea pig ones and yeah. things like that that are adorable and sometimes it's easier for a child or anyone to relate to like a sad guinea pig picture than say I am sad or even totally. say I'm in the blue right now right like totally. that that they connect with that picture and that image um or Latrice as the case may be right um but again knowing your child and knowing what it's going to connect with them um uh, and what's meaningful to them to express how they're feeling and when you find the one that works this is a great thing to put on the fridge and to just have available at kid height where they can grab and then bring and show you how they're feeling yeah. um and that adults can use too, right? Like we need to all use this. It can't just be for kids. It needs to be normalized throughout the house. Yeah, modeling this would be so powerful. I don't know how many people are gonna hang up the Latrice on <laughs> the scale on their fridges, but if you do, to just be able to say like, oh, I'm such a Latrice nine today. Oh, I had a long day and I just feel, right? To be able to say that and put that into that language, it's lighthearted. Um, it also shows that you are using the same visual support tool that you know, you're using to support your child. And we're going to give you a template in Google Slides that'll mm. help you build your own. So you don't have to worry about setting up a table and doing things from scratch. You can just plug in the images and it'll automatically format it. Yeah. Okay, so our example number two for self regulation is naming the size of the problem to figure out the size of the reaction. Um, and this is a big one because we often, right, the first step is identifying your emotions. Um, a next step is often just deciding how big a problem is and we don't always jump to okay well how big should my reaction be like what is the reaction that sort of matches this size problem so here is a how big is the problem meter um with emojis that sort of like helps you think in colors um, this is kind of like a traffic light um but also has examples of when you might have those feelings right like so for unsure surprised or frustrated the yellow one it might be like when something different happens or I forget something. Uh, and for when those things happen, we have in the purple, your strategies. And this is also, you wanna create this with your child um, and pick out the three things that will support that yellow, orange and red way of being um, so that they can choose the right strategy to match that, that problem. And to go along with this, um, this is a sensory toolkit and this is a great um, sort of match for identifying the problem because maybe what's in your toolkit is part of your strategy or your solution. And so in here we have noise canceling headphones and sensory objects and fidgets and favorite books and a Ziploc of Legos uh, and all of the things that you might wanna bring with you wherever you go so that when your child is having a hard time, they can reach right into the sensory toolkit um, your how big is the problem chart is probably in there also, and you can visually figure out where a kid is, how they're feeling, um, and what to do about it. Yeah. The other thing I'll just add about the how big of the problem, how big is the reaction, is it's really important, especially when starting out, but really all the time when using that support, to just validate what your child is saying. Um, a broken pencil on the floor might seem like a no big deal thing to us, but it was their favorite pencil or they're just really upset. It's the you know ninth thing that just went wrong for them. And so um, if they say it feels like a red, 
or a five or whatever scale you're using, um, rather than saying, no, it's not, or it's not that big a deal, the language to use might be like, oh, it feels like a five to you, or it feels like a red to you. That that's hard. That man, when things feel that way, that's really that's hard. And we should really use some strategies to to respond. To me, if I drop my pencil, it'd probably be a green. I think I could fix that pretty quick. But I hear you. I hear you. It feels like a red right now. Um, we do want to help students, children develop a sense of what really constitutes a, a bigger problem and a smaller problem over time, but especially in the moment and especially if they're really worked up, that's not the time to uh, sort of invalidate their experience um, with, you know, with the goal of, of trying to help them right, find the space on the scale. That can happen maybe later. The next morning, hey, you know, last night when you dropped your pencil, you told me it felt like a red. Was that really a red to you? Maybe they still say yes, but maybe they'll say, yeah, you know what? It was yeah. actually a green, but they couldn't access that in the moment that they were feeling very red at that time. And just like the visual emotional check ins, this is also a tool um, that you want to model, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just for your child to use, right? Like you get a paper cut um, or uh, someone cancels a meeting or you get stuck on the subway and it's broken underground for 20 minutes like you and i when you talk about that at home use the how big is the problem and start to like give examples and name that yeah so here's another um strategy that is uh that can be used when things don't go as planned um these are hard the planning the morning routine is hopefully a helpful thing but there are times when you can't anticipate when things are going differently than you expect. But there is a really nice visual support um, that actually Judy Endow, who we heard from earlier, uh, has devised um, that she calls a that's a surprise card. And the way she talked about it was that she was actually working with uh, a client um, who was autistic, who um, sometimes had uh, limited access to verbal communication, spoken language, and um, also got um, really dysregulated when something was surprising, something happened different than what they expected. And knowing this child, Judy was able to figure out some of those triggers, some of those things that might set this child off um, or feel surprising to her. But some of them she just didn't know. Some of them weren't as obvious and weren't as clear. So what they did is they developed this card, that's a surprise card that just had an exclamation point on it. And Judy gave the child three of these cards. And if something surprising happened, that child didn't have to say, oh, I didn't like that, or come up with language to describe what was happening. They just had to hold up a card and give it to Judy. And that was a signal to Judy, like, oh, something surprising happened. Maybe I noticed it as the adult, maybe I didn't, but you felt like something was surprising. They had three cards because by the time they handed Judy the third card, that was a signal to Judy that they needed to take a break and do something different, go for a walk, uh, watch a little video, get a drink of water, that the demands might have been increasing too much to be able to be productive, useful time. So it is hard to plan for the unexpected, but this is a really nice support to be able to have that again offers children a way to communicate their needs uh, in a way they might not be able to verbally. And to self-advocate. And just in case it isn't clear from this visual, each of these cards has a hole punch in the corner and there's a binder ring. And so the idea is that you'd have these all together, maybe like on a backpack zipper or on a belt loop so that as they're needed, they're like right there and accessible and a kid can say like, I'm telling you something something is happening different and I might need some help. So we've shared a lot of examples mm -hmm. of routines and directions and self regulation and we want to um, talk a little more practically about what it might take to actually produce create some of these so we made two how to visual uh, videos for you that we're going to uh, play right now. Um, we didn't want to do it live in the moment and have you know any snafus so we, we prepared these ahead of time for you all um, and we prepared two one analog just using paper and pen or whatever you have lying around and one digital if um, you're comfortable using you know google tools and, and making tables and things like that and want to make something that has clip art and stuff like that so the first one we're going to show you is um, how to make visual supports by simply drawing um, so i'm going to queue up the video right now And, oh, Andre, I forgot to check for this. Can you give me permission to uh, share my screen? Yes, my apologies, here you go. No, it's on me, thanks. Well, it should be good to go now. Okay, I'll check one more time, thanks. 
Okay, great. So, away we go. Hi everyone, Aaron here. I wanna walk through a couple of quick ways to make visual supports for your child at home that don't require any digital tools. It's just whatever you have to write with and whatever you have to write on um, that you can do either for repeating routines or just sort of on the fly when you need a visual in a pinch. Um, one thing that's really important to know, we have to get over the hump of worrying about the artistry and, and uh, art of this. It's really not about art, it's just about communicating a clear message and just the simpler the image, the better. So we're gonna look at a couple of ways to use visual supports, both in planned and on the fly ways at home. Um, the first one is anytime your child has something that they forget frequently, it's often helpful to have a very clear, simple visual um, that you put somewhere that they'll see and remember so it can help them remember that thing that they forget. For example, let's say they forget their red homework folder um, when they pack up often. It just sits on their desk at home. Well, maybe it would help to just have a post-it note with a little folder on it. It's basically just like a rectangle, a little tab thing uh, that just says folder. And this post-it note could then be placed on their desk or next to their backpack or even on the front door before they leave so they see it before they leave and think, oh, right, I've got to run back and grab that from my desk and pack that up before we leave. Um, really simple way to make a visual reminder. Again, helpful if it's a post-it or you kind of tape it up to the wall or something so it doesn't move or doesn't fall um, for something that's commonly forgotten. Another nice way to do uh, a planned support, in addition to just having a visual reminder, is to do a uh, simple schedule. And a schedule can be uh, sort of interactive if you use something like post-its or several different pieces of paper and you put one step per post-it. So for example, let's say for a nighttime routine, your child has to put on their PJs and we'll just draw a quick shirt Simpler the better, there, top and bottom, that's all we need, right? Step one is to put on their PJs. Step two is to brush their teeth. And so we'll just do a quick toothbrush like that and put the toothpaste on, maybe it's stripey toothpaste. You don't need to get that fancy. Brush your teeth is step two. And let's say step three is that they have to um, uh, choose a book for reading in bed. Oop, there. And books are like the easiest thing to draw, just like a rectangle split in half with some lines on it. That's pretty book-like, right? So if these three steps are on post-its, what your child can do each night when it's time is put on their PJs and then move this post-it out of view. Then they see that brush teeth is next and then they move that when they've done it. And then they see choose a book, they've chosen their book and they move that and these three post-its are ready to be reset for the next night. It's a nice way to add a little bit of interactive element to using a visual support at home. And then sometimes you just need to do things on the fly. Um, it's not a regular routine, but just in this moment, I really need a way to communicate this or clarify this. And a great thing to do is just to do a simple checklist on whatever you have lying around, some junk mail, some scrap paper, and um, just make little boxes for the steps, I would say. Try no more than three or maybe four, um, just so it doesn't become overwhelming. And it's helpful to start with something that's very doable. So let's say your child is playing a video game and need to get ready for dinner. Um, step one might just be finish the level that they're on and whatever the video game is, as long as you know it's not going to take an hour to finish that level. And Let's say, I don't know what video game they play, but it's like that. Uh, the next one might be to charge their phone. Um, they're done with their video game, you need to plug in their phone so it's charged for the morning. Um, draw a little plug like that, so you can see that. And then you're going to need to wash your hands to get ready for dinner. Hands, hands, there at least approximately the right number of fingers, and there's some soap if we want to draw that. Now, you can just make sure you have your child's attention, especially if they're playing a video game. 
show them these three steps, ask them to check them off as they go. And this isn't a regular routine that they need to do every night, but it might be tonight. It's really important that they um, hear and see and do these three steps. So there's lots of other uses for visuals, um, but I hope this was a helpful way to get a little bit of an introduction to what it can look like to create these on the fly. Uh, it doesn't have to be super hard. The simpler, the better. And creating an, an image is a, a low risk support. It likely is not gonna hurt, harm, confuse anything or anyone, but the chances that it um, makes things clearer or makes things more concrete or more understandable um, are really high. And the more we can do those things, um, it is, the easier it is for, for children to understand what we're communicating. Okay, great. Um, so Aaron's going to queue up the next video, yeah. which is um, me teaching how to do this in Google Slides. And so this is presuming that you've already opened a brand new Google Slide and are ready to start uh, creating some visuals like the ones that you saw in the presentation. Hey, so it's me, Cade. Um, I'm going to show you how to make a visual schedule right here in Google Slides. Um, we're going to start. Sorry about that. Got to restart. There we go. Hey, so it's me, Cade. Um, I'm going to show you how to make a visual schedule right here in Google Slides. Um, we're going to start by thinking about what kind of schedule do we want to make. I'm imagining this for a friend, um, um, and he's going to take his child grocery shopping. And usually they take the train, but today they're going to take the bus. So things are going to be a little bit different. So we're going to make a visual schedule for this child so that they know what to expect, because this is not the typical routine. So let's see. In my table, we're going to have probably five or six rows for like all the different steps of going grocery shopping. So I'm going to go to insert table and I'm just going to pick five rows for now. Great. I'm going to use these arrows to make it a little bit bigger. And sometimes the rows become different sizes. You can just highlight them all, right click and distributing rows will even them out. Now, I know that, again, I'm going to want this to be a very accessible table. So I'm going to use Lexandeca, which is an accessible font. I'm going to make the font 24, which is big. And I'm going to move myself over so that I can go here to the justify and make everything centered in the table. And now I know also that this child is really going to want to like check things off when they happen. Um, or maybe use a clothespin to move it down as the steps are finished. So I'm going to make this a checklist by going to the bullets and choosing a checklist. And now we're ready to go. Let's see, the first step is going to be take bus to supermarket. After that, we are going to go inside, get shopping cart. After that, we are going to find everything on dad's list then we'll put it on the conveyor belt let's make it really specific put food on the conveyor belt um we're gonna pay and i think this is gonna be the part where i think the kid can have some agency so i'm gonna write you do it so that the child um, knows and we actually we need to go home so i'm gonna right click insert row below and now i can add one more and since i really like this formatting i'm just going to copy paste it and take bus home so let's see this is our schedule for grocery shopping i have it nice and centered on the paper almost centered um, we could also add a title like grocery shopping with dad um, but for now we're just going to keep it like this the next part to make it visual is to add um, images. And so I'm going to show you a few different ways to add images. One way is to go to insert image, search the web. 
and it'll automatically give you this cute little sidebar where you can search Google Images. And I'm going to write New York City bus because that's what we're going to take. This looks like a good image. Insert. It's going to be way too big. I'm going to drag this corner down so it's nice and small. And here we go, taking the bus to the supermarket. And I'm going to line up all the images at the end. Okay, next one. Go inside to get shopping cart. Let's try that one again. Image. Search the web. Shopping cart. Ah, perfect. Um, this looks like a good one. And maybe you know the exact shopping carts they have at your supermarket. Pick the one that looks the same. You can also do this by taking photos. You can also do this by um, figuring it out with your kid um, and maybe like uh, choosing images together. But if you're doing this on the fly because there's like a change in the schedule, um, that's different. Um, I'm going to show you one other way to do images. Maybe you don't want to like search for images and make this complicated. Um, I'm just going to think in the emoji a list B. I can be a list. Oh, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Perfect. Um, and so I think it's good to think about um, maybe not the most perfect image, but something that approximates, right? It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, for putting it on the conveyor belt, I don't think that there's an emoji for the conveyor belt. So I'm going to think about um, take. Oh, that's like take out um, or give. Nope, no give. About grab, no grab. What else would be a good word to think of for putting food on a conveyor belt? How about groceries? Hmm. How about apple? Here we go. So I'm going to choose the apple, copy it, paste it in. And since it's on a conveyor belt and my child, this child is very literal, I'm going to go over here to the shapes and I'm going to choose a little rectangle and right underneath it, I'm just going to draw a little rectangle. Done. It's on the conveyor belt, right? Um, so the idea is that you're going to think really, really simply about whatever image could be close to what you're uh, imagining. Okay. Happy schedule making. All right, so hopefully that was really helpful. We are almost at the end. Um, we're gonna move into time for you to reflect and think about next steps. And here are all the things that we covered today. We talked about creating helpful routines. We talked about clarifying directions, supporting self-regulation, put in some how-to videos. Feel free to drop in the chat. What feels most meaningful to you? What are you ready to dive into uh, to support your child? Yeah, so we'll give you a second to, to do that. Um, you can just write one, two, three, or four for the number. You can write a specific example of something that you really like. Um, Kate likes to, to challenge us to select like an action item. Like, what do you actually feel like you're going to do next? Like later tonight, if you have any time tonight or, or tomorrow <laughs> or soon or this weekend when you do have a couple of a minutes to try. Um, what feels like your, your next step that might be supportive um, for a child in your home? So we have some questions in the chat that I just want to uh, lift up um, just to get some responses. I know we're at time, but hopefully folks can bear with us just a, a few more minutes because I want to provide some uh, responses to some of these questions. Um, so one from one of our families is my five-year-old gets caught up in the details of the visual supports a lot. Um, may want just to share at the picture of hands and soap, not actually going to wash hands. So any any suggestions just if a, if a child gets caught up in, in details of the visual supports a lot? Yeah, so particularly with younger kids, it's really helpful if they help choose the image because then it's not about an image you chose that's imperfect. It's about a signal they're creating to remember to do that. Um, and I would also say just choosing icons might be the simplest because then you're taking out so many details and it's really just the idea of something. And so lots of times I will search in Google um, just, you know, black and white icon and then the word. And then I get a, a very simple image that's representative as opposed to it being so detailed that there could be parts that feel inaccurate. Yeah. If I'd also say depends on your child, but um, if that is really important to them and you feel like there might be more buy-in and interest in the visual support as a tool, um, but they really do want to be really detailed about it, um, maybe just plan out a couple of days to work on the visual support over time and just give them, instead of, we're going to take 10 minutes and write a visual schedule yeah. about this, 
let's work on step one tonight. Tomorrow we'll come back and do step two if you know they're really going to get into the drawing. Um, balancing how much you can kind of get away with that's like very simple versus how much they just kind of have that need to have it be to look like they want it to look like is a tricky thing that you kind of have to navigate um, as, as a parent or family member um, and from knowing your own child. So I guess that's the flip side of the simple. And you can also take photos of your child. Mm. Um, and something I've also found some success with, you'd have to try it out, is um, using black and white images. So even if they're photos or clip art, just making them black and white sort of takes away some of the visual input and you're just focusing on what's in the image. Um, yeah. That's great. And um, Cade and Aaron, hey, it's Suzanne. I yeah. wanted to just jump in and um, first of all, just say how um, wonderfully exciting this was. And a couple of comments in the chat definitely reflected that. Um, and really like the way you guys kind of wove in this concept of interest and strength-based ideas and supports into everything that you've done here. Um, and I think for families and clinicians also, like tapping into what kids like and what interests them is something we can always do more of. But one of the things that, that we hear from families, um, and I would say even almost like a challenge or a question is, you know, we try something once and it doesn't work, or we say, hey, that didn't work. Um, and, and how would you respond to that? And what advice would you give families tonight on kind of like, you know, how, how, how many times should you try something or before you're saying, hmm, maybe I should look again. So I was just wondering if you, if you had a comment on that. Mm. Oh, that's a deep one. Can we stay till nine o'clock? <laughs> um, my quick response is I, I heard someone say when introducing a new strategy, um, you got to think of it as a slow cooker, not a microwave. Was that you? No. Oh, okay. Um, someone in my life has shared that. And I really appreciate that. That Like this is, um, even if it's a great strategy that's going to match the, you know, the interests and uh, meet the need of a, of a particular child, introducing something new takes time for them to understand, accept, uh, go through the motions of, get comfortable with, learn about, all those things. And so, um, Instead of, um, you know, I made that little post-it with the red folder, I put it on their desk and they didn't do it. So I don't think the visual worked. It might be a matter of um, just trying it for another day. Oh, didn't work the first time, but I bet we can get it another go. It might be a matter of tweaking it slightly. Like, oh, you know, I put it on your desk and then the folder went right on top of it. So you didn't even see it. I'm gonna put it up on the wall next. Um, it might be changing the strategy a little bit more. Maybe they need um something in addition to that little post-it note to remind them but they do take time almost no matter yeah. how you approach it what how, how fabulous the support is it'll take some time for it to to adopt and whether you um stick with it or tweak it a little bit is just sort of something you gotta play with over time from my experience i would add to that checking in with your child and saying like hey what what doesn't feel good about this or what isn't working on this what parts work for you mm. what parts don't um, which will give you really good information about how to change it if you need to tweak it. Um, as a te when I was a classroom teacher, I tried things for two weeks, um, and after the if after the first week it was like a total disaster, I would scrap it. But if it was just like working sometimes or some bumps, I would give it a full two weeks. Not to say that that's like a rule that you should follow, but um, two weeks gives you the opportunity if you're trying something every day on a weekday to try it 10 times. And that's like really good data to know like, oh, this is totally not working. I should think about this from a different angle or, oh, we're like getting into the swing of things and this seems to be working. Maybe I'll like laminate it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love, I'll just, I love the um, invitation to ask your child, like what is, <laughs> what's not working or whatever. A, because it like, as we've talked about it, encourages their involvement and, and gives them agency. But the other very practical reason I like that is like, you don't have to have the solution. Yeah, you could say like, huh, we put this post it on your desk and it didn't and we tried for three nights and it didn't work. Where else? What else could we do? If you really are stumped and you don't know what else to do, maybe your child actually has an idea like, oh, I don't know. What if we um, tied it to my backpack uh, zipper? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. And you said it. And now we have it like we have the solution. So asking your child is a great way to like involve them, but it might also solve the problem. I also would often um, 
share with families, if a strategy didn't work, think of a time this kind of thing might happen at school and ask how the teachers handle it. Because sometimes there's a way that the teachers are doing it that you can just mirror at home by changing the images or changing the words. Um, maybe they hang it in a better place, right? Or maybe the dry erase marker is always attached to it. Maybe there's like a thing you're not thinking of that the child knows from a prior experience. I told you we need till 9 p.m. to answer that question. <laughs> no. That's a good question. Though. I, I know, I know, this is really great. So just wanna give some reminders. This has been recorded and we are going to post it on our YouTube channel. So you will receive a link to our YouTube channel for this recording um, and it will have translation options so you can hear it in any of the of nine major DOE languages that we recognize. Um, the content that's here that's being provided, you will get access to those invaluable resources and supports. Um, we thank our presenters, they're always phenomenal. I know we're at time and I really appreciate everyone that's here. Please direct any follow-up questions to special education at schools.nyc.gov. We'll drop that in the chat right before we part. Um, don't, your questions won't stop here. We'll make sure to get you responses. Um, and thank you so, so much to our presenters. We are breaking up our three-part series next week. We are having summer opportunities as our BAS uh, session. And then our presenters will be back for the very first uh, Tuesday in May. So we will we'll, we won't we won't have them next week. So sad about that. This has been some great content, but we will be doing transitions in our last of the three part series, the first Tuesday in May. But look for that link and registration on our on our website, and we also will send that out to everyone to register um, in the next day or so. Um, anything before we part? Just a big thank you to everyone who participated and, and engaged. It's a tricky time of the evening to be able to take some time out and do this. And we appreciate you doing that. And also, thank you, Andre. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you to the interpreters for making this accessible to folks. We're really appreciative of and you we, all. And we hope you at home learn something new and have some new tools in your toolkit. Absolutely. I'm, I'm taking uh, diligent notes because I want to bring some of this into my own house. So thank you so, so much. <laughs> All right, with no further ado, we thank you so much for joining us for our Beyond Access series. We look forward to seeing you next week and have a great evening, everyone. Bye. Bye.